Well, good morning and welcome back to Cross Community Church. This is our third week of our Advent series. Advent just means coming or arrival, where we're celebrating the first coming of Jesus and looking forward to his second coming. So week one was hope, uh, week two is peace, and this week we are going to focus on joy and ultimately the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. So I want to begin this morning by asking you a quick question. Um, what is the best news that you've ever received? What is the, the best news that you've ever received? For, for me, I, I thought about it a bit this week, and, and listen, you don't even have to be super spiritual about it. You can just, you know, kind of be, be honest. I, I was thinking about uh, the best news I received. Was it when my wife said yes? Because that, you know, that wasn't a for sure deal. That wasn't done. Um, I was hopeful, thought I knew where we were, but thankfully she said yes. And then I thought about uh, when she told me that she was pregnant each time. That was mostly good news, a little surprising at, at a couple of those, but it was good news. And so thankful for all my children. Um, I don't know what good, good news might mean for you. Maybe it's you finally got that opportunity that you've been wanting for a really, really long time. Or maybe it was a, a loved one who'd been deployed overseas and they get the opportunity to come home or someone who's been sick finds out that they're gonna they're gonna make it or that the cancer is gone and now they get to live cancer free I don't know exactly what good news looks like for you or, or how you would answer that question but today I do want to tell you that what I have the opportunity to preach about uh, is the best news that you will ever receive this text that we get to read today it tells us of the best news that we could ever possibly receive. Our Advent reading is from Luke chapter 2. I want to read it for you one more time, and then we're just going to work through one single verse. There are four parts to it. Just work through one verse today. But read with me once again in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. It says this, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. So we're going to focus in on verse 10 today. And, and there are basically just four simple parts to this verse. And we're going to take each part and just kind of examine each. So the first part of verse 10 of Luke chapter 2 are the words of the angel when he just tells them to fear not. Now, when I was a kid, I had this impression of shepherds that they were like these rugged, tough, noble, like regal sorts of men. And I, I got this impression from King David who was a shepherd, right? That's where the whole thing started. David was a shepherd, uh, and while he was watching over the sheep, he fought off a lion and a bear with his own two hands. And, and I mean, I, young man, even now, I'm, you, you got a notch in the belt there for that. Like, I'm impressed. But then, then David, he stepped out of the pasture onto the battlefield, and God empowered him to slay Goliath. And so once again, another notch in your belt. Jason is pretty impressed. And then he goes and he leads the armies of Israel to extraordinary victories over the enemies of the people of God. And then he becomes this noble king, a man after God's own heart. So needless to say, when I was a kid and I looked at the, the, the shepherds, you know, and the nativity scene, I was like, man, those guys, they're, man, they're tough. They're noble. Like they, they have this, this aura about them. Like those are the guys. Well, if that's the perspective that you have on shepherds, it's not the perspective that would have been shared by people in the first century. If you would have lived in the first century, you would have probably thought of shepherds as kind of second-rate citizens. Some people would say that if, if there were social class, that were classes that were fearly, or clearly defined in the first century, they would have been just above the lepers. Uh, shepherds were not allowed to testify in court because they were deemed untrustworthy, unreliable. They weren't allowed to worship in the temple because their work would have made them ceremonially unclean, and so they would have to come in from shepherding and go through this uh, ritual of, of washing and cleansing before they could be made clean again. Um, they were looked down upon. They were not people who were thought of very highly. 
as we can see in the text, they certainly weren't all that brave. Because when an angel of the Lord appears to them, the, the bright light of God's glory begins to shine around them. In the middle of the night, the angel comes. They are terrified. Now, there's just two words in the Greek that describe the fear that they felt. Um, two words are phobon megon. And the first you might recognize from our word phobia or fear. This is the fear that these shepherds felt. The second word is megon, where we get our word for mega. And so these shepherds were scared. They were afraid on a great scale. They were absolutely terrified of this pronouncement of the angel who had come. The glory of God began to shine in the middle of the night. They were full of fear. So the angel, in order to deliver this good news, he has to calm them down a little bit. Like, hey, hey, it's going to be okay. This is good news for you. You got to like take a minute and just listen to me. And as, just as I begin today, maybe in this season of your life, man, you have things that are going on. You have circumstances, things that are happening, and, and what you feel is nothing but anxiety and fear. As we begin today to look at the good news, the best news that you will ever hear, I just want to encourage you to fear not that your Father in heaven, he has you, he cares for you, he's working on your behalf. So, Number one for you to think about this morning, fear not. Receive this good news that God has for you. So phrase one, fear not. Number two, the second part of this verse is just good news. Two words, good news. But it's profound news. We're told what the good news is in verse 11 when the angel pronounces to the shepherds, For unto you is born this day, this day. They would have been hearing it live when this today is born to you in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this was profound news. This was like life-changing, earth-shattering sorts of news. As a matter of fact, when this news made its way back to Jerusalem, Matthew chapter 2 tells us that all of Jerusalem and Herod along with them, they were greatly distressed upon hearing this news. Like this was such a big deal that everybody was talking about. Everyone would have been speaking about this thing that had happened, this profound event, this news that had been delivered announcing the arrival of the Savior. Now, if you know the rest of the story, the good news, Jesus was the Messiah, this baby that had been, imbo- that had been born that was lying in this manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. This was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, who had come to deliver God's people from their, their sins and to uh, reunite them in a right relationship with him, uh, to save them, not just from sin today, but ultimately all the way into eternity that we might spend eternity with God. This is really, really good News. This was the child that had been foretold by the prophets. This was the child that had been anticipated by the people. The one, the Lord, the Messiah, that all of God's people, all of the nation of Israel had been watching and longing for. This is the child, the arrival of the child that was prophesied in our text last week by the prophet Isaiah. 500 years before this moment when uh, the, the child was born, laying in the manger, 500 years before the prophet Isaiah had said, as we read last week, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace, the thing that everyone in the nation of Israel had longed for and looked forward to was now happening in their midst. The prophesied Messiah had finally come, and this was good news of great joy. Now, I don't know about you, but I tend to anticipate the end of stories. You know what I mean? 
a matter of fact, if you're speaking to me, I'm anticipating the end of your sentence before you say it. You know, that's just kind of how my mind works. I'm like, where are they going with this? Uh, I sat down and watched a, a movie with my daughter or, or a show with my daughter yesterday. And we don't get to do that a lot, so we don't have a show that we regularly watch. And so I'm like, oh, hey, here's what looks like a, a show my daughter will like, and it's PG, so we don't have to fight through all the, the junk. We can just kind of sit and watch something. And it turns out to be like the most cliche high school love drama you've ever seen in your life. And I was like, oh, did I have to choose this one, right? So the girl moves in from out of town into a house full of like six or seven really handsome boys. And she goes, just, anyway, you know the story, right? It's like, here it goes. Which one is she going to pick? And it was, it was honestly kind of disappointing, you know, because I knew the end before they even, they even told it. Well, if you thought that you knew the end of this story before it's told, you'd be wrong. Because if I was looking forward to kind of anticipating the way that the story would end, I would say, man, God has been planning his plan. He's been working his plan of redemption since the very beginning of creation, since Genesis 1-1. This was God's plan to reveal himself to his people and to save them from their sins and for a relationship with him for eternity. It, it, the prophets had been prophesying this for hundreds and hundreds of years before this moment happened. All of Israel had been looking forward to this moment. And so if I was going to predict the end of this story, I would say, here it is. This is the happily ever after. The credits are going to roll pretty soon. They're all going to embrace Jesus as their Savior. They're all going to be saved. Again, everyone's going to be happily, live happily ever after. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. When this news was delivered... The people were so excited. The good news of great joy. They heard that their Savior had come. Unfortunately, they didn't receive Jesus as well as they heard this news. They didn't receive the Savior with the same enthusiasm that they had awaited him. And the issue with the nation of Israel... The reason many of them didn't come to know the Savior and walk with him and follow him and serve him is because they didn't know that they even needed a Savior. For many people in the nation of Israel, what they did not recognize is that they were sinful before God and they needed God to come in the flesh and to rescue them from their sins. And so here's what they would have thought. If you could have gone back to Jerusalem first century um, and just interviewed people on the street and you would have been like, hey, do you know anyone who needs a savior? They probably like us would have been like, oh, let me tell you. I know somebody uh, who needs someone to save them, right? Their life is a wreck. Uh, but they never would have told you that they did. Or it's unlikely they would have said, yes, um, I need a savior. Or that the, the Israelite nation, the Jewish people need a savior. Because they were dependent upon two things that they thought made them right with God. They thought somehow justified them before God. The first was their pedigree. They would have pointed back and said, hey, we're descendants of Abraham. I don't know if you know the story of the Bible, but uh, in the Old Testament, God came to Abraham and said, hey, I'm going to make a covenant with you and to all of your descendants after you. I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people and I'm going to bless you and you're going to serve me and it's going to be beautiful, right? And so all the nation of Israel, they're like, see, we're descendants of Abraham. We're good with God. We got the covenant. And if their pedigree wasn't enough, they would have pointed you to their performance. They would have said, hey, and we keep the law. And the law wasn't something that just kind of was present uh, in the lives of the, Old Te or of the New Testament Jews here. It was the thing that would have dominated their lives. They kept the law and their whole lives reflected it. They ate according to the law. They gave according to the law. They worshiped and they offered sacrifices according to the law. And even when they had sinned, the law prescribed the day of atonement, the sacrifice to be offered so that their sins might be atoned for. If you would have asked the, the members of the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, hey, do you know anyone who needs a Savior? They would have been like, yes, but they never would have thought it was them. The reason that they didn't receive the Savior is they didn't realize they were in need of saving and can I be really honest with you? And I fear that that is true in this church and all around us right here in LaFleur County. That just like the Jewish people, some of us will point back to our pedigree 
Be like, my granny knew Jesus, my parents knew Jesus, the rest of my family knows Jesus, like my friends know Jesus, my coworkers know Jesus, I must know Jesus. I must be good with God. Like, look at my pedigree. This is who my family are, that we're Christians. Or maybe some others would, would point to their performance before God. Say, you know what, I, I do my best to live good before the Lord. I do the right things, try to treat people well. Heck, I show up at church on Sunday, I give my money, I serve sometimes, I help people who are in need. And when we think about what gives us right standing with God, we might point back to our pedigree, our family, or we might look at our performance and say, hey, that makes me right with God, right? The Apostle Paul would say, no. It doesn't make us right with God. As a matter of fact, all of us have sinned and fall, and fall short of the glory of God. We have been separated from God because of our sin. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, Paul spells this out very clearly for his people, the Jewish people. He says this. <clears throat> he says, we ourselves are Jews by birth. Abraham's our father, right? We trace our lineage back. We're the people of God. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. We're not like those people. We're pretty good folks. And we got a, a pedigree, and we're not like the sinners. We live according to the law. But in verse 16, he says, yet or but. But we know that a person is not justified by works of the law. We're not justified by our pedigree. We're not justified by our performance. But, he says, through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. We will never have right standing with God by either our pedigree or our performance. The only way that we can have right standing with God is through faith in Jesus Christ. This good news that we're talking about is not that, hey, there's a way for you to clean your life up and live well enough to somehow ingratiate yourself to God, and then he's going to love you and save you. The good news is that there is no way that you could be good enough or do enough to somehow find your way into God's favor. The good news is that even though we are separated from God because of our sin, Jesus Christ came. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He went to the cross. He died there on the cross for us shedding his blood and he rose on the third day victorious over sin and death and our hope is not in our works it's not in our goodness our hope is in his work for us that he performed on the cross we're justified not by our pedigree and not by our performance but through faith in Jesus Christ trusting him to do for us what we could never do for ourselves when I was a little kid my parents used to take us in the summers, we'd go to the city pool, which looking back on it, yeah, I don't know, you know, it was pretty clean, but uh, I used to love to go to the pool, and, and as a pretty little kid, they would take us, and we would swim and have an awesome time, and I remember one day in particular, mom and dad were both there, we're going to the city pool, and you know how parents are, they're slow, you know, they, they aren't as eager as kids are. And man, I was ready to swim on this day. And they're fumbling around with the, the bags and the towels and the clothes and probably putting sunscreen on. Things that as a kid seem ridiculous but are probably important. Well, my parents were taking so long that uh, when they turned the back, I just jumped into the pool. And the issue with that is I was like too young to learn, know how to swim at that point. I was still wearing floaties. And once I get in the pool, I immediately realize I don't have my floaties on. This was a bad idea. And my, my parents tell the story that um, they're looking around. They, don't, they can't find me, and they turn, and they look in the pool. And as I'm in the pool, I'm not struggling. And I'm not swimming. I'm not thrashing around. I'm standing on the bottom of the pool looking up at them like, hey, you're going to have to do something. It's time to like step up. I'm, obviously, I'm going to need you to come and help me, right? And that's exactly how we come to faith in Jesus. And it's not our thrashing around. It's not our religious activity or our effort or our works is somehow going to save us from our sin. We come to Jesus by just depending 
upon him, coming to him in faith, trusting him to come and rescue us out of our sin that we are drowning in, that we could never rescue ourselves out of. Like, that's Jesus, and that's the good news for us. You can't be good enough, but he was. Like, we can't earn it, but he did. It's a price we couldn't pay, but Jesus paid it for us. And so this is good news, right? Fear not. Behold, I bring you good news. The next section here is great joy. I think if you were to survey the American public or even survey Christians in the church, and you were to ask, hey, are they a people of great joy? I'm afraid the answers wouldn't be as favorable as we would hope. I know some people of great joy, but I don't always live a life of great joy. But for those of us who have received the good news, who have believed the gospel and been saved by Jesus, we have reason for great joy. And I, just, just two things that should produce like overwhelming joy in us. The first is joy over what Jesus saved us from. Y'all, I, I grew up in this church. People here know me. They know the good. They know the bad. And they know the ugly. I went to school with many of you and had an opportunity to observe me in some of the worst of times. And to be honest with you, sometimes I think back and I am ashamed of the way that I acted and the people that I've hurt, the things that, I have done, that I've done. And listen, I knew better. I had every opportunity to get it right and I blew it. And I look back and I'm so thankful for Jesus and that he saved me and for what he saved me from. Because I'll be honest with you, until Jesus got a hold of my life, man, I was headed headlong for destruction. And it only would have gotten worse if not for his grace shown in my life. And so one reason for great joy, the things that Jesus has saved us from. The second reason for great joy is what Jesus has saved us for. That Jesus has brought us in. He's adopted us as his children. He's made us his own. He's given us a real and true and full and abundant life in him. And that abundant life begins today and it lasts all the way into eternity. A couple of weeks ago, Brittany and I had a chance to sit down with some friends of ours that we, we had not spent time together, like much time together, in 12 years. And in, in the intervening period, this couple had adopted a kid. And so we did the thing that, that friends do, you know, especially when you get older. We kind of catch up on life and then like breaking out the pictures of our kids. Like, here, you need to see. And so <clears throat> the first picture that the wife showed me uh, was that of a boy they'd adopted from a third world country. And man, he was this beautiful two to three year old little boy and he's got these big dark eyes and a smile on his face. Uh, but immediately you can't help but notice that he's got this stomach, it's a belly that's really swollen from malnutrition. And they began to tell the story of this young boy, just two or three years old. His parents had both been killed. He'd been orphaned. Uh, he'd been living in an orphanage, and they were doing the best they could to care for him, but he was still very malnourished. And these kids uh, were in a lot of danger of being trafficked by some pretty wicked men that lived near there and would prey upon these defenseless kids. And they were selling them, just terrible things that were going on. So our friends had gone on a mission trip there, and they met this little boy, and they knew that he belonged to them, that they had to take him home. And so they began to tell the story about their journey of all that they went through to have, having, trying to adopt him. And so I think they said they spent close to $100,000 it cost them through the legal processes in both countries and the travel and all the things that they went through. They spent close to $100,000 and many, many, many months of working and filing paperwork and working through attorneys and praying that God would somehow make a way to bring this boy home. And then uh, when it was finally time, the mother spent 41 days in that country fighting with various authorities and doing the best that they could to bring him home legally, that they, he could you know, legally be adopted as their son. But then at the end, uh, uh, all they told us, they showed us another picture of him. 
and that two to three year old boy is now 15 years old and he's like a a handsome, well-built young man. He was flexing in his picture. You know, he's strong, and he, he's a strapping young man. He looks good, and it was just such a joy to see that. But then as the, the parents continue to tell us about their son, man, you could tell just a, a great deal of pain was present there. And even though they'd saved him from this really difficult life in, in this country and now brought him here and, you know, he's got plenty to eat and people that love him and, and lots of good things going, um, there's still a lot of anger and resentment in this child. And even before, just before they'd come to dinner with us, he'd really hurt them with some of the things that he'd said. And I listened to that dad through, I mean, you could just see the pain. It was palpable in his speech. But he said these words that really stuck out to me. He said, I just wish he could understand the life that we saved him from and all that we went through to bring him home and to give him the life that he has now. And as he spoke those words, it was like God just put a spotlight right on me. It's like God was speaking those very words directly to my heart where God was saying, Jason, I just wish you could understand the life that I saved you from and all that I went through to bring you home and to give you the life that you have now. And, it, and I was still present in the conversation with my friends, but man, I was distracted the rest of the time. I got in the, the car with Brittany when dinner was over, and I was just overflowing with gratitude. It's like God was just replaying all of his goodness to me, all of the things that he has saved me from. Well, and I didn't deserve any of this. This is just God's goodness to my life. All of the gifts that he's given to me that were completely undeserved. I was just thanking God for my wife and for our kids and for our church and for our friends and for all of the good things that we've been given in our life that we completely don't deserve. Church, we are a people who have received good news of great joy that ought to make us full of joy no matter what's going on circumstantially in our life we have reason for joy because of what Jesus has saved us from and because of what Jesus has saved us for we have eternal hope in him we have been given riches in the kingdom of God Jesus told us himself the enemy John 10 10 the enemy the thief and he's come to steal kill and destroy that is the direction of our lives apart from Jesus and then Jesus says, but I came that you might have life and have it to the full. That you might live the richest, most fulfilling, most satisfying, most abundant life you could ever possibly live, beginning now and spanning into eternity. That's what Jesus did for us. This is good news of great joy. We as the people of God should be rejoicing for all that God has done for us. We have reason for great joy. And then there's one more piece to this verse. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. This good news of great joy wasn't just for the Jews. It was for everyone. The Savior was born. Christ the Lord had come. And he'd come not just for his chosen people, the nation of Israel, but he'd come for us. Now, I have a question for you. Why do you think? Because this is an interesting thing to consider. And we're not told, so we're just allowed to speculate a little bit. Why do you think God chose to deliver this news? The best news you could ever possibly receive. Why do you think he chose to deliver this? In the middle of the night, in a remote place out in a field, to people that were deemed untrustworthy, so much so they weren't allowed to testify in court. Unlikely, unlikely time, unlikely place, and delivered to an unlikely people. And once again, the Bible doesn't tell us this, so I'm going to speculate a bit. But here's what I believe. I believe that God brought his good news to these unlikely people in this unlikely time and at this unlikely place so that we would know that there is no one Nowhere, not at any time, that Jesus can't save. That this news can't reach their hearts. This news can't transform them. Last week, I mentioned that there may be some of you who are here. 
But you think back to your life and your story and what you've done, what you've been through, and you might think that you've, you've gone too far, you've sinned too much, you've done too many things too many times, that somehow you're far beyond saving. And I said the words that Jesus is a greater Savior than you are a sinner. And I believe that is true. As a matter of fact, I believe that God delivered this message, this good news of great joy, which is for all the people. I believe he delivered to these shepherds in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, to help you know that this news is for you too. It's for all people, not for the special people. I mean, it could have come um, as a pronouncement in the temple at Jerusalem among the religious elites, right? But instead, this message came through shepherds in the middle of the field and in the middle of the night. I believe that Jesus loves you and he cares for you and he died that you might find new and true and abundant life in him. And today, I wanna invite you to trust in Jesus. And if you don't know him, would you just cry out to him today? We're gonna have a time of response and a time of invitation. And as we sing a song up here, Maybe you just take a moment to bow your head before the Lord and cry out to him, acknowledging that you are a sinner and you're in need of a savior. You're like the kid at the bottom of the pool. You're drowning in sin and you can't save yourself and you need him to come and save you. Today, if God has made the gospel clear to you and you've understood your sin and that God sent a savior to redeem you from that sin and to make you right with him, today I want to encourage you to respond in faith to Jesus to offer yourself in faith to him, asking him to save you and to be the Lord of your life. If you're here today and you are a believer, you're like, no, I know Jesus, I'm confident of that. But you think about your life, it's characterized by anything other than joy. I wanna encourage you to take some time to just praise God for who he is and what he's done, to praise God for what he's rescued you from. You remember that life of sin, of emptiness and brokenness that you were living, that life that was getting you nowhere? It was like the same cycle over and over and over again, spinning your wheels but getting nowhere. And remember that life that Jesus saved you from and praise him and thank him. Take time to celebrate and rejoice for what he saved you from and take time to celebrate and rejoice for what Jesus has saved you for. He adopted you as his own child. And you are now a son or a daughter of God. And he's given you an inheritance both today and then it spans into eternity that you'll enjoy eternal life with him one day in heaven. You see, the thing about good news is it's only good news if you receive it. It's only good news if you respond appropriately. And so today, I believe this is the best news you're ever gonna hear and you have an opportunity to respond accordingly. However God may be stirring your heart today, would you just respond in obedience to him? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the price that you paid, the son that you offered, the suffering that you endured, and that you did that in love for us. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for the person who's here, and maybe they've heard the gospel a hundred times, but today you made it clear in their minds, and you're drawing them to faith in you. Lord, I pray that you would do so, and I pray that they would respond in faith to you. God, for the believer who's grown comfortable in their own salvation, and maybe they've grown so comfortable with all the gifts and blessings that you give them that they've begun to grumble about the things that you, they, that you haven't given. Lord, I pray that today would be a day of rejoicing and celebration, day of a remembrance for what you've saved us from and then ultimately what you've saved us for. May we be a people of great joy, a people who have received this good news and rejoice as a result. Lord, we pray this in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. Amen.